Welcome into the KC Sports Report. I'm your host, Wyman Wheeler, and today I'm going to recap the entire slate of NFL games from week one before Thursday Night Football kicks off tonight. It was an amazing weekend of football. We're so glad it's back, and there are a lot of games to talk about, so let's not waste any more time and talk football, starting with Ravens Chiefs. <clears throat> Greetings. We are the Baltimore Ravens. After an offseason full of hard truths and difficult questions, we've come up with a solution to end our playoff woes. After failing to utilize our prolific running attack in the last game we played, we're now going to ship off half of our running backs for one of the best backs in the league, and then fail to utilize our prolific running attack in the very next game we play. Seem like a winning recipe? It seems like Ramar just can't control himself, whether it's untimely fumbles, taking unnecessary hits on the run, or crying like a baby after it's over. He and the Ravens as a whole can't help but squander every gift-wrapped opportunity they get. They just look like a completely different team when playing against the Chiefs. Now, Lamar is great, don't get me wrong. He's a two-time MVP for a reason, but his playoff history is what it is, and until they can beat a top contender, it's hard to take this team seriously until they put their money where their mouth is. And perhaps they should tone, tone, tone it down a bit. Nice. As for the Chiefs, Mahomes is still the best in the league. The wide receivers look not terrible again with big-time performances from Xavier Worthy and Rasheed Rice, and the defense held their own, holding a scary Ravens offense to just 20 points, although Nick Bolton tried his hardest to make that not happen. Despite some lingering drops left over from last year and an un-Mahomes-like interception, the Chiefs looked like a force to be reckoned with. They didn't just look rejuvenated. They looked electrifying, even with those mistakes, which should send shivers down the spine of the rest of the NFL. Packers-Eagles The consensus gathered from this game could be worlds different depending on when you tuned in. At the start, horrible sloppy offense, followed by more horrible sloppy offense. Next thing you know, both offenses are popping and the defenses look highly suspect. All things considered, it makes for a pretty entertaining product. After two ugly turnovers, the Eagles put it together after the Packers failed to capitalize off of said turnovers. Jordan Love looked like the second half of 2023 version of himself, appearing to have soul-bonded with Jaden Reed at some point during the offseason. Unfortunately for the Packers, the Eagles looked like the first half of 2023 versions of themselves, and it all had to do with Saquon Barkley. Saquon looked as good as he ever has been. I honestly didn't expect it. Last year, they threw in the towel in embarrassing fashion during a playoff game, and I expected that to bleed over into this season. It's only one game, but if they can keep this production going, they could be back in the Super Bowl. As for the Packers, any silver lining they could pull from this loss was terminated after Jordan Love went down. An MCL sprain with an expected three to six weeks out. Not the worst case scenario, but not what you want to see after a solid game from Love. He wasn't put on IR, which could mean they expect a quick recovery, but can Malik Willis get even one win in that span? Who knows? The biggest takeaway for both of these teams is that they should be terrified that their defenses will ruin everything. Saints Panthers. Panthers fans, <laughs> I, I truly feel for you. I, I really do. You, you traded away everything you once had for a chance at a franchise quarterback, and you wound up here, losing by 30 points to the Medicare team of the NFL. The funny thing is, you might have had your franchise guy if your owner wasn't a meddling, insolent jerk. More on CJ Stroud momentarily. Not that he's a meddling jerk. I'm talking about David Tepper. The owner. Anyway, I was rooting for Bryce to take a step this year. I didn't have this team in the playoffs by any means, but bringing in the new coach, Dave Canales, and getting some new pieces to throw to, I thought maybe this year we would see enough from Bryce Young to reasonably believe he could be the starting quarterback in Carolina for this foreseeable future. But after Sunday's performance, I, I know it's only week one, but the Carolina Panthers could have the worst record in football three years running. It looked that bad. Uh, to the Panthers' credit, the Saints have a good defense, but it's not like Bryce's mistakes were forced by the Saints. Bad interceptions, overthrows to open targets. It was tough all over, not to mention a terrible O-line, fumbles, and defense that made Derek Carr look like Drew Brees. So yeah, the Saints scored all over the Panthers, and if they were playing against the Panthers every week, they could be on their way to a playoff berth. Unfortunately, they only play the Panthers twice in a year, and not to look ahead to next week, but Let's just say the Panthers' defense is not the challenge that the Dallas defense will be. I should probably say something about the Saints. Um, their offense looked good, but again, it was the Panthers' defense, so you really can't 
judge them too positively, in my opinion, off of that. I just don't believe in Derek Carr, but who knows? He may surprise me, or he may not. Titans, Bears. The conversation surrounding both of these teams has been very different, despite having similar off-seasons. Both were middle-of-the-road teams last year who had flashes of efficiency here and there. Both teams went on a shopping spree in free agency, grabbing multiple high-end pieces on both sides of the ball. However, the thing that separated these teams was the level of hope the fan bases had going into this year. Caleb Williams has pumped new life into the Bears. With his skill set combined with a juiced-up offense and a solid defense, this team could be something the city of Chicago hasn't seen since 1985. Being featured on this year's Hard Knocks also puts you on a lot of people's radars. On the other hand, the hype for the Titans has been non-existent due to the improvement of other teams in their division and the fact that Will Levis is a question mark at the quarterback position. No one thinks that the Titans will be good this year, but their offseason moves have to make you stop and think if the Titans think they have something. So you have two middling teams from last year who have playoff aspirations and are looking to see improvement at the quarterback position. So what did the game tell us? Well, for the first half of the game, the Titans had the Bears shaking, mainly because Caleb Williams looked terrible. The preseason hype faded quickly for Caleb as he only accumulated 93 yards the entire game. The Titans' defense gave him multiple welcome to the NFL moments, including a big scramble that ultimately ended in an even bigger sack. Will Levis looked great to start and looked to have developed nicely in the offseason. All of a sudden, it was 17-3 at halftime, and the Bears looked like they might have been the most overhyped team in the league. But then, the second half started, and the Bears got a boost not from the number one pick, but from their special teams and defense. A couple of field goals and an awful Will Levis pick six, and the Bears found themselves winning by a point despite having less passing yards, rushing yards, and yards per play than the Titans. Caleb Williams is now the first starting rookie quarterback to win in week one since 2002, even though he got outperformed by Mr. Mayo for most of the game. Giants-Vikings. Daniel Jones will make $40 million this year. $40 million. His contract ultimately sent Saquon packing, and this is what they have to show for it. If you could describe this performance in one word, woof. We shouldn't have expected much from Jones. I mean, he played in the preseason against the twos and the threes and looked just as bad then as he did on Sunday. If only the Giants defense could offer any decent offerings on the day, but it turns out Sam Darnold throwing to Justin Jefferson is just as dangerous as Kirk Cousins throwing the ball to Justin Jefferson. Justin Jefferson will do Justin Jefferson things. But, you know, I really hope Darnold can put something nice together this year. Several ball knowers had the Vikings locked into the number one pick next year, namely because of a seemingly cursed offseason with the tragic passing of their round one pick and the season-ending injury to J.J. McCarthy, who looked like he could have been the week one starter if he hadn't gotten injured. Sam Darnold became the starter, and everyone had them written off. Week one is week one, but... To overcome all that noise to the tune of a 28-6 victory has to feel great. The Vikings are just hoping the win was because of their team play and not the level of opponent faced. Again, Daniel Jones. Woof! Bills Cardinals. After yet another soul-crushing end... <laughs> Sorry, I, I shouldn't laugh. After yet another soul-crushing end to their season last year, Josh Allen and the Bills looked to make a statement in Week 1. The only issue was they would have to make that statement without Stefan Diggs, one of the main contributors that helped Allen become the quarterback he is today. The biggest question about the Bills was whether or not Allen could carry a team with less talent on the offense than he's had since 2019, and whether or not he should. On the other side of the field, the Arizona Cardinals finally get Kyler Murray back from injury. He's been a dynamic player in the past, and the team added the consensus best wide receiver in the draft. This game had the potential for fireworks, and there were fireworks galore. To start the game, it was the Cardinals, actually, who pulled out to a surprising 17-3 lead. Kyler was spreading the ball around the field and was looking sharp under center. The Bills, on the other hand, appeared to shoot themselves in the foot over and over again until Josh Allen decided to put on his cape and score 14 points unanswered to take the lead after halftime. The Cardinals kept it competitive throughout, but once Josh Allen decided it was time to do Josh Allen's stuff, the Bills looked unbeatable. 
However, after another superhuman touchdown run from Josh Allen, the Cardinals scored the first ever kick return touchdown in the era of the supposedly dynamic new kickoff, bringing the score within a field goal. However, after a 39-yard Tyler Bass field goal to make the score 34-28, despite Kyler and the Cardinals offense marching down the field to the Bills' 30-yard line, the Cards couldn't get it done in the last minute, 56 seconds. They opt to run on a long third down which was questionable, turning the ball over a down later, and the Bills won a pretty great game. The thing is, and being completely honest, if Josh Allen can continue to make this offense look like the Bills' offenses of old, he could be looking at an MVP season. We'll just have to see if he can keep it up, or if he'll fumble it away like he tends to do, like he did in this game, and in many games before that. Texans-Colts. The last time these two teams met, the winner took the AFC South. The loser had to pack up for vacation. The winner was, of course, the Houston Texans, led by rookie sensation C.J. Stroud, the envy of Charlotte. The other team was the admirable Indianapolis Colts, who were led by everyone's favorite NFL journeyman, Gardner Minshew, who took over the team after Anthony Richardson went down last year. Richardson was incredible in the games he played last year, but in his rookie season, he just couldn't stay on the field. This year, the Colts are hopeful he can put together a 17-game stretch. So, you have two rookie phenoms from last year going at it after a principal matchup to end the year. As you may have predicted, this game was awesome. One of the best of the week. The Texans were being hyped up all season as a potential Super Bowl contender, but some people were thinking the team could get a little too drunk off of their own Kool-Aid, and let some people down. Well, if this game is any indication, those thoughts should have never reached outside voice level. All of the new additions contributed. Stefan Diggs from the Bills, now with the Texans, caught two touchdowns in the red zone. Joe Mixon ran for nearly 160 yards and a touchdown. On top of that, the familiar faces, Nico Collins and Tank Dell, had several pop plays between the two of them, with Collins looking primed to have a particularly standout year. Everyone was impressed with the Texans, but honestly, I was equally impressed with Indianapolis in this game and their ability to go toe-for-toe with H-Town. Anthony Richardson was lighting the Texans secondary up with deep bomb after deep bomb. AR-15 was not perfect. He whiffed on a couple of throws, but it's clear that his freakish athleticism is going to be fun to watch at the very least this season. If all works out, they could very well end up in the playoffs as a wild card. The Texans are a great team, and the Colts were within a two-point conversion of tying the game. Regardless, this was an amazing game, and I'm looking forward to watching both of these teams this season. Bungles Patriots. You know, I just think that once Joe Burrow has a full offseason with no lingering injuries and a complete training camp, he'll be able to overcome his annual early season slump. I mean, after all, he's clearly the second-best quarterback in the league, and sure, T. Higgins is out due to injury, but hey, at least Jamar Chase is back. <laughs> he only held out pretty much the whole of training camp, but he's back now. And the Bengals at least get the added advantage of playing the New England Patriots, a team so bad that they can't play their rookie quarterback for fear he'll die on the field. So the Bengals' defense will take on Jacoby Brissett, who isn't terrible, but is certainly not an awe-inspiring choice for your week one starter. So, it seems that everything is coming up roses for the Bengals. What could possibly go wrong? Everything. Joe Burrow looked awful yet again in week one, as he does every year. It looked like he could hardly throw the ball over 20 yards. It was that bad. He had, like, only one completion that went over 20, 25 yards, yada, yada, yada. And Burrow wasn't the only disappointment on the Bengals. The running game looked to miss Joe Mixon a heck of a lot, and they had two of the most hilarious turnovers in the entire NFL afternoon slate. And the best part is this vomit stain of a game came against the Patriots, who no one believed would leave the stadium with a win. In all fairness, the Patriots played a clean, mistake-free football game, and Gerard Mayo waited a long time to get his shot at head coach, and in his first game, he delivered. He schemed a remarkable running game and coached that defense to hold Jamar Chase to under 70 yards. Christian Gonzalez looks like he's going to pick up right where he left off from last year, by the way. So, credit to the Patriots for overcoming the odds. And as for the bungles, I have two words. Womp, womp. Steelers-Falcons. Maybe marching out a 36-year-old quarterback fresh off of an Achilles injury is not the best idea. And on top of that, maybe paying him 
$180 million fresh off of an Achilles injury isn't the best idea either. The Falcons made a lot of noise this offseason, a weird combination of big swings, base hits, and whatever baseball analogy you want to tie to drafting Michael Penix after signing Kirk to that monster deal. Everyone I heard this offseason, including myself, had the Falcons penciled into the playoffs by means of winning the lackluster NFC South, but after seeing Cousins in this game, you have to wonder if it's even a wise idea for him to be out there at all. The Falcons claimed his struggles were not due to lingering injury, but if you watched the game, you could see that that was not a typical Kirk Cousins performance. If Kirk Cousins can't light it up in the noon window, that's a big issue. On the other side of the ball, the Steelers had their own quarterback issue. They had to go from a flawed veteran who holds onto the ball too long to a flawed young player who also holds onto the ball too long. Russ had won the starting job, but with a nagging calf injury, Fields took the field, and while he didn't light it up by any means, he did just enough for TJ Watt and the Steelers defense to terrorize Kirk and get the road dub in Atlanta. And that's the story of how the Pittsburgh Steelers won a game by scoring no touchdowns, and now sit alone at the top of the AFC North, just like everyone predicted. Week 1 is weird. Jaguars-Dolphins. We'll see what happens to the Dolphins when the temperature drops, but until that happens, they look explosive. They were unable to get the ball into scoring position for most of the game, but after a timely Travis Etienne fumble, stacked up 13 unanswered points like it was nothing. The Jags blew it big time. The Dolphins even missed a field goal late in the game, but the Jaguars could manage to score a single point in the second half. And who's to blame? The defense held the high-flying Miami offense to 20 points. Well, in the second half, Trevor Lawrence was 3-for-7 on passing attempts and 2-for-10 on third-down efficiency, which, according to my metrics, is uh, not good. Couple that with some questionable calls from Doug Peterson on third and fourth downs, and you're left with the answer. It was an epic choke job by the offense, the entire offense. You can't lose like that. You just can't. And that's the least of Jacksonville's problems. Trevor Lawrence was once hailed as the franchise savior. And it, if last season's performance from Stroud and the handful of games Richardson's played are any indication, he could be sitting as the third best quarterback in that division. This is a make and break year for Trevor. He cannot afford any more games like this. Oh yeah, I feel like something else crazy happened in this game about the Dolphins on Sunday. Eh, can't remember. Broncos Seahawks. If the Bears game wasn't enough, this is your reminder that preseason performance has no indication of regular season success, especially in the case of rookie quarterbacks. This leads us to Broncos quarterback Bo Nix, this year's Kenny Pickett. In what was undoubtedly the weirdest game of the weekend, Bo Nix immediately brought Broncos fans back to reality with a Russell Wilson-like performance throwing fairly accurately in short yarded situations, struggling mightily on third down, and throwing boneheaded interceptions while the game was still in play. The Broncos should have had this game in the bag early after Geno Smith started the game with a bad pick and the Broncos defense started out strong, forcing two safeties and nearly a third. However, the Seahawks got settled down, Geno threw for 171 yards and a touchdown to Charbonnet and managed to run one in himself for six as well. The Broncos only had one touchdown on the day by way of a pretty sick Bo Nix run, so Honestly, the Broncos fans should be primed for a Week 2 win. Get your hopes up, Broncos fans. That's what I would do. Chargers Raiders. As for the other two remaining AFC West teams, this game really was the battle of mid. Each team was sloppy in execution all the way through to the fourth quarter. The key to the Chargers winning had everything to do with the Raiders turning the ball over three times to the Chargers zero times. The Raiders controlled the game from time of possession. The only reason they found themselves in a hole was due to a lack of discipline, which reflects poorly on the head coach, Antonio Pierce. Perhaps the Raiders hired the wrong interim head coach? I'm of course referring to when Rich Bisaccia led a team devastated by tragedy and scandal to the playoffs after the firing of John Gruden, only to then pass on Bisaccia in the offseason in favor of proven commodity Josh McDaniels. And we all know how that turned out. Gardner Minshew threw for nearly 300 yards in this game, and his teammates kept blowing it. Although he himself was not blameless, he had a horrific fumble himself. Justin Herbert's team, on the other hand, did most of the heavy lifting for him. While he had a modest game, Jim Harbaugh's running backs he got on loan from his brother combined for 161 yards. J.K. Dobbins, of course, having a monster day with 135 yards and a touchdown. Other than that, there's not a whole lot to say about these two teams. Coaching was the difference, and the Chargers finally have a real one that may be able to deliver them from bad to okay to 
maybe even good. Cowboys, Browns. I'll start with the Cowboys because honestly, I, I don't know what to make of this win. Dak looked great after getting his money. CD looked good, if not dialed back due to his absence at training camp and Micah Parsons, Trayvon Diggs. And the rest of the defense had the Browns begging for mercy. They had one of the most complete wins of week one. So why don't I know what to make of their win? Because Deshaun Watson played as bad as I'd ever seen a quarterback play in the NFL. Daniel Jones, Bryson, <laughs> yeah, Joe Burrow, uh, should all send Deshaun Watson a thank you card for making them look like pro bowlers this weekend. It, he was that bad. He, he threw a ball six or seven yards out of bounds in the direction of an open receiver down the sideline. Like, what what happened to you, man? Like, uh, that that's why this game is hard to judge for the Cowboys because everything about how well they played on the offense and defense had everything to do with how utterly terrible Deshaun Watson looks. And I'm sure if Deshaun didn't have a million reasons for people to hate him, the reaction to this game wouldn't be so harsh. But, I mean, come on, Deshaun. You're cooked. Cooked. We knew this last year, but we all got caught up in Joe Flacco's comeback that you were let off the hook. Well, now there's nothing for you to do but wait to get benched for Famous Jameis or DTR or anyone else, but... Anybody will be better than you. And you know what? I don't even feel all that bad for Cleveland fans because, and we'll move right into the next game, Buccaneers Commanders. The Browns were completely fine with sending Baker Mayfield out of town on a rail, even after he brought that team from nothing to their first playoff win in a thousand years. And yeah, I get it. Baker was very mature and had a lot of commercials, and that was a problem. And last year he played in, the last year he played in Cleveland, he played through injury when he shouldn't have. And I get it. But they turn him away at the door in favor of a guy with 22 sexual assault cases against him, giving him the most guaranteed money to an NFL player ever. And they didn't even give him a thank you. They just sent him to football purgatory in Carolina. And luckily for Baker, he found his way on the Buccaneers last year and had one of the best seasons of his career. So, I mean, he was so impressive that he signed a deal in the offseason making him their QB of the future. And the Buccaneers saw that they had something going last year and brought back pretty much everybody in an effort to run it back, so to speak. And last Sunday, the Bucs looked incredible. Baker looked incredible. He tallied four touchdowns, the most of any quarterback this weekend, and straight up looked like the best quarterback of the entire week. As for the Commanders, they didn't do a whole lot. Jaden Daniels maybe looked, maybe looked like the best rookie quarterback this weekend, but that really isn't saying much. And he was much better with his legs than he was throwing the ball, which makes your job as a quarterback a little bit tough. But the main story I'm looking at is if Baker Mayfield can put together a Dark Horse MVP campaign. I was incredibly impressed with his performance this week. And that's all on that game. Lions, Rams. This game was my NFC Championship game going into the season. And after the game was played, I feel very confident about my prediction. Both of these defenses came out with statements. And when the offenses had to respond... The Lions were the only team who could answer the bell at first. The Rams made it deep in the red zone at the end of the first half, but Stafford threw a pick to Kirby Joseph to keep the score at 10-3 to going into the halftime break. This game was filled with so much good football, it was insane. The story of this game, though, was Matthew Stafford willing this team to success. I mean, the Rams faced several injuries to their O-line during the game, and Puka Nakua but despite all that, he kept making play after play after play and got the Rams to overtime. Unfortunately for Stafford, the Lions won the coin toss and David Montgomery just plowed through the Rams to end the game. The Lions and the Rams both look like teams will be fighting for the Super Bowl, and when they meet up again, we'll see if the outcome is any different. Jets, 49ers. Of all the teams I had making the playoffs in the AFC, the Jets were the one team I was not overly confident in. An old quarterback, injury-prone offensive pieces, including your old quarterback, and an unproven coaching staff gave me pause, but I ultimately decided that the Dolphins' inability to play in a minor wind chill gave me enough assurance that the Jets could finish second behind the Bills in the East and secure a wildcard spot. Well, after week one, I think I want to rescind that statement. Rodgers looked fine in the game, but the offensive game plan was one-dimensional and the 49ers had them entirely figured out by the second series. Brock Purdy and the 49ers didn't miss a beat since the Super Bowl. No CMC, no worries, just run Jordan Mason 500 times for the same dominating result. And I know the 49ers are great offensively, but the Jets' defense is supposed to look better than this, right? 
400 yards of offense is not the look the Jets were going for. Ultimately, I just think the hype around the Jets is based around a fantasy and has no part in reality. But for all of these teams, they can simply relax knowing that, hey, it's only week one, eh, except the Panthers. Y you, guys, you guys might be screwed forever. And that's a wrap on NFL Week 1. Thank you for watching this video. It was a beast to write and put together. So if you liked it, be sure to hit the like button and let me know down in the comments you want more videos like this. If you want to keep up with me, you can follow me on Twitter at Wyman Wheel and follow KC Sports Report for more content and video updates here on YouTube. Um, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to KC Sports Report. For more Chiefs content, until next time, thank you for watching, and go Chiefs.